very much indeed, and thank you very much, Elsie. And thanks for coming tonight. We deeply do appreciate that. And could I sort of exhort you, uh, as Oliver has been saying, whenever our brother Dennis, who, by the way, is all week in Limavati this week, he's an extremely busy man. He's known all over the world. He travels the world, and he preaches in Africa, America, and you name it. And he's preaching to thousands and thousands of people. And you know, whenever he comes here, it's only four Wednesday nights, it would be great to see the hall full. Please, please, I beg you, plan to be here. I know that it's not always easy, but maybe just for once we could get babysitters and get the men and women out, or whatever. But do your best to fill the hall, because it would encourage God's servant if he comes along and sees a real response. And then he'll carry away a good report with him. Now we're going to read this evening Psalm 118, 118th Psalm. And I want to take time to familiarize ourselves again with this divinely inspired messianic writing by reading it together. So, Let's just cruise down the psalm together here. And there's a call to praise in verse 1 to verse 4. Oh, give thanks unto the Lord, for he is good, because his mercy endureth forever. Let Israel now say that his mercy endureth forever. Let the house of Aaron now say that his mercy endureth forever. Let them now that fear the Lord, that's us, say that his mercy endureth forever. And look at the last verse. O give thanks unto the Lord, for he is good, for his mercy endureth forever. You know, you'll notice here that God's goodness and mercy is the very first thing that is in the psalmist's mind. The sin question, brother and sister, must always be settled first as we engage in fellowship with God. Make much of the blood as you come into the presence of God. And, you know, Psalm 107 and verse 1 and 2 brings this point out where we read, O oh, give thanks unto the Lord, for he is good, for his mercy endureth forever. Let the redeemed of the Lord say so, whom he hath redeemed from the hand of the enemy. You see, this exhortation is for the redeemed of the Lord, those that God has brought back out of the slave market of sin. Otherwise, you would be rejoicing in the goodness and mercifulness of God who will be forced to cast you headlong into the torments of hell because of your refusal to repent and trust Christ as your Savior. So it is for the redeemed of the Lord. And we do thank God that he is good and that his mercy endures forever. You know, diamonds will not endure forever no matter what the jeweler tells you. And if you're saying tonight, what have I got to rejoice about? What have I got to thank God about? Listen, it's of the Lord's mercies that you and I are not consumed. And that mercy endures forever. God delights in mercy. Isn't that what Micah teaches us? Who is a God like unto thee that pardoneth iniquity, that passeth by the transgression of the remnant of his heritage, he retaineth not his anger forever, because he delighteth in mercy. He delights in it. He will turn again, just like the ocean, when the tide goes out. He will subdue our iniquities. He will have come passion upon us. Thou will cast all their sins into the midst of the sea. These are wonderful truths for us to delight in here. And we need to give thanks to God. I wonder... Have you taken time recently to thank God for his goodness and for his mercy that endures forever? So you can see here five times in this psalm, he reminds us of this wonderful truth. Five is the number of grace. 
And the grace of God is shouting out here that his mercy endures forever. I don't know what it is you've done, but I can assure you there's a merciful God in the meeting tonight. Take a moment and clear it and have done with it and know it's gone. Now, the psalmist gives testimony to his own experience of God's goodness and mercy in his life in verse 5 to 18. But inasmuch as this is a messianic psalm, we see also here the sufferings of our Saviour at the hands of wicked men from verse 5 to 21 and then verse 27. Let's read from verse 5 here. I called upon the Lord in distress. The Lord answered me and set me in a large place. The Lord is on my side. I will not fear. What can man do unto me? You see, when he says the Lord is on my side, it says in the margin, the Lord is for me. God is for you. And if God's for you, who can be against you? He says, the Lord taketh my part with them that help me. Therefore shall I see my desire upon them that hate me. It is better to trust in the Lord than to put confidence in man. It is better to trust in the Lord than to put confidence in princes. All nations compassed me about, but in the name of the Lord will I destroy them. They compassed me about, yea, they compassed me about, but in the name of the Lord I will destroy them. They compassed me about like bees, they are quenched as the fire of thorns, for in the name of the Lord I will destroy them. Thou hast thrust sore at me that I might fall, but the Lord helped me. The Lord is my strength and song, and has become my salvation. The voice of rejoicing and salvation is in the tabernacles of the righteous. The right hand of the Lord doeth valiantly. The right hand of the Lord is exalted. The right hand of the Lord doeth valiantly. And then you see the resurrection here. I shall not die, but live, and declare the works of the Lord. The Lord hath chastened me sore, but he hath not given me over unto death. Open to me the gates of righteousness. I will go into them, and I will praise the Lord. Now, I just want to mention in passing here, uh, as he talks about opening the gate, this is also a processional hymn of praise. And so I want you to visualize, if you will, in your mind's eye, this great procession of priests and people uh, wending their journey up to the temple courts and precincts and as they approach the temple gates they shout out in the words of verse 19 to 21 open to me the gates of righteousness I will go into them I will praise the Lord this gate of the Lord into which the righteous shall enter I will praise thee for thou hast heard me and art become my salvation and then we see the ascension and the headship of the exalted stone in verse 22. The stone which the builders refused is become the headstone of the corner. This is the Lord's doing, and it is marvelous in our eyes. This is the Lord's doing. It is marvelous in our eyes. Now in verse 23 to 25, we see in the spirit of prophecy the end of the Sabbath and a new beginning as the Lord's day is being kept, followed by a period of salvation. Verse 23. This is the Lord's doing. It is marvelous in our eye. This is the day which the Lord hath made. We will rejoice and be glad in it. Not the Sabbath. Not the seventh day anymore. But the first day of the week. The day of resurrection. Save now I beseech thee. O Lord. O Lord I beseech thee send now prosperity. We think of the early church. 3,000 saved in one day. Then another 5,000. And then we see the people expecting a return here. Blessed be he that cometh in the name of the Lord. We have blessed you out of the house of the Lord. And then we read, God is the Lord which hath showed us light. Bind the sacrifice with cords to the horns of the altar. You'll notice that the puny cords of men or their cruel nails couldn't hold this sacrifice. But he was held to the blood-soaked tree at Calvary 
by cords of divine love for you and for me. Thou art my God, and I will praise thee. Thou art my God, I will exalt thee. O oh, give thanks. 26 to 29. Love so trained kindly by the cords of divine love for you and for me. God is the Lord which has showed us love. Thine the sacrifice of cords, even the Son of the Lord. Open eunuch, and he sends someone to teach you. I wonder if you're aware of just how much this particular psalm was upon the mind of our Savior in the very last week of his public ministry on earth, just before he went to Calvary. He had this psalm, Psalm 118, in his mind constantly. Do you remember our Lord Jesus Christ's triumphal entry into Jerusalem and how that the multitude on the Mount of Olives spread their garments under the little coats, hooves, and cut down branches and strawed them in the way, and they quoted from verse 26 of this psalm. They cried out, Blessed is he that cometh in the name of the Lord. Psalm 118. And then the Lord taught the parable of the vineyard and tells the aggressive religious leaders about the wicked husband men who ran to the vineyard from a householder and when he sent his servants to collect his share of the harvest they beat the servants and then they eventually killed the owner's son and heir the lord jesus says in uh, matthew 21 verse 40 to 46 when the lord therefore of the vineyard cometh what will he do to those husband men they say unto him he will miserably destroy those wicked men and will let out his vineyard unto other husbandmen, which shall render him the fruits in their season. Jesus saith unto them, now listen carefully. Did you never read in the scriptures? Now he's talking about Psalm 118. Did you never read in the scriptures the stone which the builders rejected? The same has become the head of the corner. This is the Lord's doing and it is marvelous in our eyes. Here's Christ quoting this psalm. Therefore I say unto you, the kingdom of God shall be taken from you and given to a nation bringing forth the fruits thereof. Then he goes back to that thought of the, of the foundation stone again. He says, whosoever shall fall on this stone shall be broken. But on whomsoever it shall fall, it will grind him to powder. I wouldn't like to be in his position, would you? And when the chief priests and Pharisees had heard his parables, they perceived that he speak of them. And when they sought to lay hands on him, that is, they wanted to arrest him, they feared the multitude because they took him for a prophet. So you can see how often this psalm is on the Lord's heart. Again, the Savior quotes from this psalm as he laments over Jerusalem. In Matthew 23 and 39, For I say unto you, Ye shall not see me henceforth, till ye shall say, Blessed is he that cometh in the name of the Lord. And he's quoting the psalm again. And then they all sang it together in the upper room, just before his betrayal at Gethsemane and his crucifixion at Calvary. How do we know that? Well, you see, this messianic psalm is the final one of a group of six psalms called the Hallel. Psalm 113, 114, 115, 116, 117, and 118. And so they were sung at the great feasts, three great feasts of Israel, the Feast of the Passover, the Feast of Pentecost, and the Feast of Tabernacles. Now, it was during the Feast of the Passover that the Lord sat in the upper room keeping the Passover just the way the Jews keep the Passover still today and there were four cups on the table and they sang the first two psalms before the drinking of the second cup and then they sang the other four psalms after the drinking of the fourth cup if you ever get a chance to see a Jew laying the Passover table it's a treat and so it's more than a possibility that this was the hymn sung by the Lord Jesus and his disciples after he had instituted the Lord's Supper, just taking one of those cups, cup of redemption. 
In Matthew 26 and 30 we read, And when they had sung in him, they went out into the Mount of Olives. Of course you'll remember that after the death and burial and resurrection and ascension of our Lord Jesus in Acts chapter 3, God used Peter and John to heal the lame man at the gate of the temple called Beautiful. Silver and gold have I none. He had no gold at all. Not even a ring. Not even a fisherman's ring. Silver and gold have I none, but such as I have, give I thee in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise up and walk. And the word of God teaches this man was completely healed. A man who had never walked in his life. The power of God hit his ankle bones, and he didn't even have to learn to walk. He leapt for joy as he entered in to the temple. Acts 4, 1 and 3 says, And as they speak to the people, the priests and the captain of the temple and the Sadducees came upon them, being grieved that they taught the people and preached through Jesus the resurrection from the dead. That's the thing they didn't like more than anything else. And they laid hands on them. They arrested them and put them in hold unto the next day. Then the next day, when all the religious hierarchy were gathered at Jerusalem, verse 7 says, And when they had set them in the midst, they asked them, By what name, by what power, or by what name have you done this? Now you see, this was a very cunning leading question that Peter was being asked here, because Deuteronomy 13, verse 1 to 5 teaches that if anybody does a miracle, a sign or a wonder in anyone else's name but God's name, then that prophet or dreamer of dreams shall be put to death. So it's the head on the chopping block, so to speak, for Peter right now. And if he ever needed a demonstration of the spirit and of power, he needs it right now. And Peter knows full well he's in the hot seat and he courageously takes a deep breath, steps forward, and verse 8 to 12 states, Then Peter, filled with the Holy Ghost, said unto them, Now he wasn't cheeky, he wasn't rude, Ye rulers of the people and elders of Israel, if we this day be examined of the good deed done to the impotent man, by what means he's made whole, be it known unto you all, and to all of the people of Israel, that by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, I think that Caiaphas must have cringed at that moment, by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom ye crucified, whom God raised from the dead, even by him doth this man stand here before you whole. And then he says this, This is the stone which was set at naught of you builders, which has become the head of the corner. Psalm 118. Peter's preaching that Christ is risen, exalted Lord, is the fulfillment of Psalm 118, verse 22. And then, as if that wasn't far enough for Peter to go, he says, neither is there salvation in any other. You want to know by what name? I'll tell you by what name. There is none other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. I tell you, that was some preaching, wasn't it? A fearless preacher. Peter the Apostle didn't believe in a multi-faith religion, did he? Or that there were other ways to God. Our Savior himself told him, No man cometh unto the Father but by me in John 14 and 6. And remember that Peter returns to this very same subject in his first epistle in chapter 2 and verses 2 to 9 where we read, As newborn babes desire the sincere milk of the word that ye may grow thereby. It's hard to get the babes under the sound of the milk of the word. It really is. But anyway, pray them in that God will bring them to get what they need most. If so be ye have tasted 
that the Lord is gracious. Listen, to whom coming as unto a living stone, disallowed indeed of men, but chosen of God and precious. He's back at Psalm 118 again. Ye also, as living stones, are built up a spiritual house, a holy priesthood, to offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God by Jesus Christ. And then he says this remarkable thing. Wherefore also it is contained in the scriptures, Behold, I lay in Zion a chief cornerstone, elect, precious, and he that believeth on him shall not be confounded, shall not be disappointed, shall not make haste. Unto you therefore which believe, he is precious, but unto them which be disobedient, the stone which the builders disallowed, the same is made the head of the corner. He's back. Psalm 118 again. And a stone of stumbling and a rock of offense, even to them which stumble at the word, being disobedient, whereunto also they were appointed. But ye are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a peculiar people, that you should show forth the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. Children of God, we definitely don't praise them enough. We don't praise him enough. And that's why God brought us out of the darkness in the first place into his marvelous light, that you should praise him. Peter had spent time studying this stone in more ways than one. And he's using Isaiah 28 and 16 here as his text where we read, Therefore thus saith the Lord God, Behold, I lay in Zion, and notice it's God that led in Zion for a foundation, a stone. A tried stone, a precious cornerstone, a sure foundation that he that believeth shall not make haste. The gracious Holy Spirit of God himself has chosen to repeatedly use this object of a foundation stone in one form or another as an emblem of our wonderful Savior that we have just been singing about. A wonderful Savior is Jesus my Lord. May the Holy Ghost has this emblem in his mind and he wants it to be in ours. And I know he's the branch and I know he's many other things but he's the foundation stone and he wants us to take time to read what he said about the Lord Jesus as our foundation stone. Now over the next two Wednesday nights that is including this one I want to look a wee bit closer at this. I'm only doing a polyfiller job here, you know. Dennis is coming in three weeks' time, and so they said to me, you fell in. <laughs> and so that's what I'm trying to do. We're going to be, God willing, next week studying the stone. You can understand I can't start into the book of the Revelation in two weeks. So we're studying the stone next week. But this week, or what's left of it, uh, our study is entitled Finding Our Faith's Foundation. Finding our faith's foundation. I remember hearing Brother Davy Craig, that great old Scottish evangelist, telling of how that he asked a group of children one day, what's the difference between a brick and a stone? I wonder could you answer that? What's the difference between a brick and a stone? And one of the wee boys got all excited and he put up his hand and he said, sir, I know. He said, go on then. He says, man makes bricks but only the Lord can make stones. That was good, wasn't it? Man makes bricks, but only the Lord can make stones. And as we've already seen in 1 Peter 2 and 4, Peter says that Christ is a living stone. And in verse 5, he says that we believers are living stones. Did you know you were a living stone? We have the same nature and the same resurrection life as Christ himself. 2 Peter 1, verse 2 to 4, Grace and peace be multiplied unto you through the knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord, according as his divine power has given unto us all things that pertain unto life and godliness through the knowledge of him that hath called us to glory and virtue. Listen. Whereby are given unto us exceeding great and precious promises that by these ye might be partakers of the divine nature 
having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust? How does Peter say we become partakers of the divine nature and be born again as children of God into God's own family? Through the living, infallible, eternal word of God, the exceeding great and precious promises. It's by these you become partakers of the divine nature. And we can truly sing that great old chorus, It is no longer I that liveth, but Christ that liveth in me. Now that's the only foundation that the Lord has laid for your faith and mine, that you might be saved and know it. These things are written, we read in 1 John, that you might believe. You can sign a decision card saying that you trusted Christ on a certain date. You can put up your hand every Sunday night in life when appeals are being made. Listen to this gospel message. Put up your hand and the pastor will pray for you. Oh, praise the Lord, there was 20 saved tonight. Where do you find that in God's word? You can put up your hand and go to the toilet if you're going to school children, but it won't save you. And even if the pastor prays from now to kingdom come, it won't save you. Yes, you can say a prayer after someone, partly. You can be slain in the spirit, so-called, and fall flat on your back on the floor. You can be sprinkled as a baby. You can even be fully immersed in water and be baptized in the scriptural manner. You can become a member or an elder or a deacon in an evangelical church and assembly. You can speak in unknown tongues. You can preach and cast out demons in Jesus' name and do many wonderful works and at the end of the day be lost in hell forever. Now that's something that couldn't possibly happen to a truly born again redeemed believer because they are eternally secure as far as God's concerned but there are so many who are tragically deceived into a false assurance by another gospel which is not another we read in Galatians chapter 1 verse 6 to verse 9 how did our Lord Jesus Christ preached the gospel. He made it perfectly clear, friend, that repentance before God for our sins is crucial. He challenged superficial faith and put it away by warning of the danger of a false foundation. Turn with me, if you will, to Matthew chapter 7. Matthew chapter 7 and verse 13. Matthew chapter 7 and verse 13. Now here we're reading a part of that great Sermon on the Mount. As our glorious Saviour is concluding his mighty message to the multitudes. It would take three chapters, it does take three chapters, to hold, to contain, to record the Sermon on the Mount. So I'm not going into three chapters. This is the moment of his tremendous evangelistic thrust to the souls of men and women at the end of this best known of all sermons that the Savior ever preached. And as he's applying the message to them, he's setting a choice before his hearers. He's calling for their response to his words. He's calling like Joshua to Israel on an earlier occasion, choose you this day whom you will serve. But he is in effect warning that there is a way that seemeth right unto a man. It seems right, but the end thereof are the ways of death. A swamp seems like solid ground until you tramp on it and then it's too late. There's a way by which people are persuaded that they will get to heaven that has every appearance of being the right way, the true way. And the Lord is revealing that this is a satanically inspired trap that damns souls for all eternity, a false gate that professes to be the very gate of heaven. 
And the Lord Jesus Christ tells us that it deceives vast multitudes of unsuspecting truth seekers who thoughtfully and consciously and deliberately choose the wrong gate and actually enter into the highway to hell in their delusion. He says here in verse 13, Enter ye in at the straight gate. For wide is the gate, and broad is the way, that leadeth to destruction. Listen to this, and many there be which go in thereat. Many. Now, not everybody. Not everybody. Because straight is the gate, and narrow is the way which leadeth unto life, and few there be that find it. Not 800 million. Few there be that find it. Then he says, Beware of false prophets which come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are ravening wolves. He's, he's talking about their clothing. Watch for the clothing that's unscriptural. False prophets in sheep's clothing. Now you're not automatically born onto this broad way. Although I know full well that we're all born in sin and shape and in iniquity and death has a claim on us already. Yet this road is not just the road that mankind walks by nature. The Lord says many go in through this. Not everybody. If it was the way we're born that puts us in this road, then, friend, it would be everybody. But this road had to be chosen. This road had to be taken. This road had to be entered by a massive and very magnificent wide gate. And these souls who are seriously trying to find the true way to heaven and peace with God are duped by Christless religion, cold, dead, formal, ritualistic, ceremonial religion. They're duped. You'll find that everyone that is not saved by grace that goes through this gate, they believe you have to do something. Every one of the religions in the world will tell you there's something that you have to do to be right with God. Now, so many others are deceived by false prophets. The Lord Jesus says in verse 21, Not everyone that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven. Listen to this. But he that doeth the will of my Father, which is in heaven. Not he that listeneth. He that doeth. Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in thy name? And in thy name have cast out demons? And in thy name have done many wonderful works? And then will I profess unto them, I never knew you. Depart from me, ye that work iniquity. And then the Lord says this, Therefore, whosoever heareth these sayings of mine, now he's talking about his sayings, undoeth them. I will liken him unto a wise man which built his house upon a rock. This is deadly serious. Our Lord Jesus is warning us that many are giving the impression that they are genuinely redeemed believers, but they're spiritually dead as the day they were born. They haven't got eternal life dwelling within their beings. They're false professors. They're pretending to be something that they're not. These men aren't in the pubs. They're preaching. These people are not gangsters. They're doing many wonderful works. And you and I would say, pause a tear. If we were where they are, surely God would bless us. And what's worse is the fact that some of them have convinced themselves that Jesus is their Savior. And he isn't. We need to know about that. The Lord says there'll be many. Why did he tell us that? Because he doesn't want that. He wants them to do it right now. He doesn't want that. The Lord doesn't want to have to say to anybody, I never knew you. But the Lord Jesus Christ makes it perfectly clear it's not enough to merely listen to his sayings. We've got to put them into practice. We've actually got to do what he's saying. If he says you must be born again, it's imperative. There's no alternative. Then don't rest until you're born again. That stands to sense, doesn't it? 
It's not even enough for you to preach to others and be convinced that you're casting out demons out of other people and spending your time being involved in charitable works. Jesus our Lord says that you can do all that and die and go to the hell's torments forever. Listen to Almighty God talking about the scornful rulers in Jerusalem in Isaiah 28 verse 15 and 16. Because we have, because you have said we have made a covenant with death and with hell are we at agreement, when the overflowing scourge shall pass through, it shall not come nigh us because we have made lies our refuge and under falsehood have we hid ourselves. Then it says this, Therefore thus saith the Lord God, Behold, I lay in Zion for a foundation, a stone, a tried stone, a precious cornerstone, a sure foundation. He that believeth shall not make haste. We're back at that stone again. The Lord says if you want to be sure that you're not making a refuge in lies, then you get to Calvary. You get to the Christ of Calvary's cross and you focus everything on him. You see, that's the foundation stone again. Now, we need a foolproof foundation to put our faith and trust in for the future down here on earth and for judgment and eternity. We know that. And the Lord Jesus already said in our reading, Therefore, whosoever heareth these sayings of mine, I can't emphasize that enough, Whosoever heareth these sayings of mine and doeth them, I will liken him unto a wise man which built his house on the rock. The rain descended, the floods came, the winds blew and beat upon that house, and it fell not. Why? Because it was founded upon a rock. So it's the sureness of the soul save, saving sayings of the Saviour. The sureness of the soul-saving sayings of the Savior that we have our eye on just now. What do I tell you? If the Lord hadn't said to me, Him that cometh unto me, I will in no wise cast out. I would never have had assurance. But because he said that, I know him in. Hallelujah. I know for certain that he hasn't cast me out. And he said, I am the door by me. If anyone enter in, he shall be saved. That's good enough for me to get my wee house built on. All his exceeding great and precious promises are the guarantees of God. I've proved this for 36 years and more. And some of you have proved it for far more than that. If you build on this foundation, then you're not only building on the written word, but you're reading it continually. And you're feeding on it. Listen, I hadn't time to go into everything, but let me just say this on the way by. Man shall not live by bread alone. Now, we'll make sure we get that, don't we? And plenty of it. Far too much of it. If you're anything like me. Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. We need to keep our noses in this book. Because man is not just a digestive system. If someone's wife dies, there's no point in you taking them to the Europa. It won't meet the need at all. As a matter of fact, they'll probably not be able to eat the meal. You see, man doesn't just consist of a body. We have a soul and a spirit, and we need to feed that soul and spirit. And what I'm saying is this, if you build on this foundation, then you're not only building upon the written word but you are building upon the eternal word in the beginning was the word and the word was with God and the word was God the same was in the beginning with God all things were made by him and without him was not anything made that was made so you have the written word you have the eternal word but you're also building on the incarnate word because the word was made flesh and tabernacled among us and we beheld his glory the glory as of the only begotten of the father full of grace and truth in John's gospel chapter 3 you know you needn't turn to it Nicodemus came to Jesus by night one of the 70 members of the Jewish Sanhedrin that great Jewish court or council the ruling body of the religious affairs of the Jews in New Testament times. And he addresses our Lord Jesus as a rabbi. 
He's not coming in a haughty manner, far from it. I tell you, I admire this man, I really, really do. And he actually confesses to believe that Jesus was a teacher come from God, who was able to perform God's miracles. No man can do these miracles that thou doest, except God be with him. Now there's a boy, and I believe he's on the earth today, you don't have to accept that, but there's a boy that's going to be able to do lying wonders, and he's not from God at all. But no man can do these miracles that thou doest, special kind of miracles. These were messianic miracles. These were sign miracles. These were authenticating who Jesus really was. And he says, no man can do these miracles that thou doest except God be with him. So the Son of God told this man, you're not saved. Now I'm putting that into my language. He told him, you're not in the kingdom yet even. He says, you must be born again. Except a man is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. And this sincere, upright, honest, intellectually brilliant individual, suddenly standing there, knowing the scriptures from Genesis right through, realized that he was an unregenerate soul on his way to a Christless hell. It's amazing, isn't it? And yet that thief who should have had the hands cut off him for stealing people's property, saved by the grace of God. Friend, listen, Nicodemus is a God-given example of a soul with a false faith in Jesus. He had a crying need in his soul for reality. He was sick of the sham that he found in cold dead former religion and he wanted peace with God and that's why he couldn't even wait until another day goes by. He had to get to the root of this matter and he gets to the feet of Christ. He's at the right place, isn't he? And his great mind is sent reeling when the Lord tells him, you must be born again. How can a man be born when he's old? He's dealing with this in a basic way. He knows what age he is. He's taking the information that Christ is giving to him, and I assure you he's not being sarcastic when he says, can a man enter the second time into his mother's womb and be born? He really is doing his level best to understand this truth. He's seeking to be honest. He's seeking to be real. And then he says this, how can these things be? How can these things be? Now, for someone who's convinced that Jesus is a teacher from God, is it not strange that he can't accept Christ's naked word on the matter? Remember, he's no fool. Far from it, let me tell you. He was educated to qualify as a master of Israel. He's a ruler of the Jews. He's a great preacher and teacher of the infallible word of God. Everybody that comes down to the feasts, they know him to see. There's no photographs, there's no papers, there's no TVs. But from childhood, their fathers, their grandfathers, their uncles will say, look quick, there's Nicodemus. That's him there. Friend, listen, he's still in the dark as far as his knowledge ascending up to heaven into the higher mysteries is concerned. He knows nothing about it. Highly respected. Scriptures are his second nature. Intellectually brilliant, but it's not enough. Whenever it comes to the things of God. 1 Corinthians 2 and 14, you know it well. The natural man, or mankind in the generic sense that includes women, as he's born into the world, receiveth not, he rejects, he doesn't accept, the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness unto him. Listen to this, neither can he know him. Stop trying to teach people that haven't even got life. You may as well go out there and try and teach a brick. Neither can he know them because they are spiritually discerned. The Lord Jesus says to Nicodemus, look, we speak what we do know and testify what we have seen. And he says, you don't receive our witness. 
You know, if you receive the witness of men, the witness of God is greater. If men tell you one thing and God tells you another, then remember, God is right and the men are wrong. And you'll not go far wrong. You receive not our witness, Christ says to him. Now then he gets his vision on himself, on the Savior. Now I want you to picture the Savior and he's saying, if I have told you earthly things and you believe not, I tell you of heavenly things. You see, we have the word of God for our foundation, but here is the one who is the living, eternal, incarnate word, and he's the one that speaks the word. So when we trust his word, we're trusting him, isn't that right? The church's one foundation is Jesus Christ, her Lord. You see, he's telling Nicodemus this isn't human speculation, it's divine revelation I'm giving to you. And thank the Lord he did give it to him. Or we'd have had a problem if we didn't know you must be born again. Hebrews chapter 4 verse 1 and 2 says, Let us therefore fear lest a promise being left us of entering into his rest, and if you should seem to come short of it. For unto us was the gospel preached as well as unto them, but the word preached didn't profit them, not being mixed with faith in them that heard it. You see, this is the bit. It's not only realizing, yes, faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. And the word of God is a rock of ages that we build our very future abode on. But it's the one who gave the word of God that we're trusting. It's not a book. It's Christ. On Christ the solid rock I stand. All other ground is sinking sand. And you'll remember those women with the spices and the ointments coming to anoint the body of Jesus while it's still dark. And as they make that journey, they're preoccupied with the insurmountability of the problem that lay up ahead of them. Who shall roll the stone away for us? It's very great. And they're all taken up with their own inability and they grossly underestimated God's miraculous ability because he had already removed the problem. He had envisaged their plight beforehand, and in grace he had removed the stone before they ever got near. Listen, don't be crossing bridges before you come to them. You might never come to them. The words of God's angelic messengers to their souls were these. Why seek ye the living, or him that liveth among the dead? They had completely forgotten the resurrection. They heard the words. The Lord had told them repeatedly he would rise again from the dead. Even the enemies remembered. We remember that that deceiver said that he would rise again. So put a guard outside the tomb and seal it. And there they are. Do you think they're stupid? They don't even look to see if the body's there. They knew he was dead. They knew he was in the tomb. And friend, when they rolled a stone to the mouth of the tomb and sealed it, Christ was in there. A napkin wrapped about his head that would suffocate you within minutes. And friend, he didn't need to be suffocated. He was already dead on the cross. He said to John, I am he that liveth and was dead. And behold, I am alive forevermore. They had forgotten the truth of the resurrection. Now the angel said this. He's not here but is risen. Remember. Remember. How you speak unto you when he was yet in Galilee saying the son of man must be delivered into the hands of sinful men and be crucified and the third day rose again here's what it says and they remembered his words it changed everything when their fear crossed the word of God it changed their darkness into day they ran to tell others the glorious news Jesus is alive so what I'm saying is it's one thing hearing the word of truth. It's another thing believing it. The Lord's risen tonight. The Lord is in the midst of our gathering tonight. He's alive forevermore and he lives in the power of an endless life. It was exactly the same for the two on the road to a mess. And they were so downcast and discouraged. And even though they knew that the women folks said there were angels who said Jesus was alive, 
they had turned their backs on the place of blessing and they were heading away from Jerusalem on the very day of the resurrection. Friend, it just seemed to be one thing after the other in rapid succession that sunk their little ship. I wonder, has your little ship sunk? Because if it hasn't, if there's not a sunken ship here somewhere, then I've got the wrong message. But I know I haven't. It was a day of disappointed hopes. They were so mentally preoccupied with their adverse circumstances, they didn't even recognize the Savior. And they knew him as well as I know you. And he's walking step by step with them. He's looking into their eyes. He's talking to them. It didn't even register. You see, unbelief. It pulls his truth out completely. It wasn't that they didn't know him. They knew him well. But they were so blinded by their sorrows and unbelief, they didn't even recognize him. And just as they headed off, friend, Jesus himself drew near and went with them. Now, I know Oliver said some of these things on Sunday, and I could have clouded him because <laughs> every time you opened your mouth, you were saying something else out of my message. And I says, Lord, keep him quiet, <laughs> or love nothing left. Listen, the Savior doesn't write us off. Savior didn't say, he that puts his hand to the plan looks back isn't fit. Let them two boys run on there. He understood exactly where they were and he drew near to them and he went with them he loves you more than tongue can tell you know and he opened their understanding to the scriptures and once they got the scriptures and their faith laid hold upon the word of god their eyes were open see it changes everything psalmist ah got to leave him there remember the word unto thy servant upon which thou hast caused me to hope has God given you a word that you're hoping in and whenever the discouragement comes and, and, and the doubt raises its ugly head you grab hold of that word and you, and you find comfort in it remember the word unto thy servant he's looking for a divine deliverance of some kind he's longing for a mighty intervention of the power of God in his own life he said, Lord, remember that word you gave me. Remember the word unto thy servant, upon which thou hast caused me to hope. It was a sure and certain hope if God had given it to him. Has God given you a word? You're waiting for God to fulfill it. A word of comfort, a word of deliverance. Friend, listen. When he says, remember the word, the word unto thy servant, that's the foundation of the faith that is hidden in his heart. And whenever he comes to God with it, and he says, remember the word, he's pleading that promise. He's taken it to the throne. And whenever he comes claiming the fulfillment of that promise from the one who gave him the promise, that's not only the foundation of his faith and the pleading of the promise, but it's the raising of the rod of God, just like Moses when he stood at the Red Sea and he held it up and he waited for God to make a way through for him and he knew that God would do it. Did God do it? I tell you, God did it. The whole world will never forget the day that he rolled the sea away. Now, I'm almost finished. Let me just say this, that Christ says the words that I speak unto you, they are spirit and they are life. And we have a living stone tonight, a true foundation, not sand, but rock. And God led it, not men. And it's immovable. And there's a wee thing that I need to show you in Psalm 118 as we go, because if I didn't show you it now in the next 30 seconds, then I wouldn't have given you the message. You see, in verse 8, we find a little verse that is a keystone in itself. Do you know why? Because it's the center piece of the entire scriptures. It's the center verse from Genesis to Revelation. And it says in verse 8, it's better to trust in the Lord than to put confidence in man. What God's saying tonight, I believe, is this. 
trust in me. That's what he's saying to you. I don't know what the problem is, but he's, he's coming out into the open. He's saying, look, you trust in the Lord. Even if you haven't got a word, trust in the Lord that gives the word. It doesn't matter if the whole world comes against you. And I know that men are giving you trouble. And they're coming like beams at you. And I know you're being attacked, but it doesn't matter if the whole United Nations of the earth come against you, as they will at the battle of Armageddon. God will never desert a soul who trusts in him. But God will assuredly rise and manifest his delivering power and reveal himself to be the unfailing helper of all that trust in him. Now that's what he wanted me to tell you tonight. You said it took you a long time to get there, but at least we got there, didn't we? See, I'm going if the Lord tarries and we're spared and Liz is coming with me. We're going over to speak in Guernsey four or five times in a few weeks. And we're going to speak because it's the centenary of the day that the foundation stone was laid. Hundred years. I wasn't there at the time. A hundred years ago they laid the foundation stone. Let me tell you something. There was two world wars since they laid that foundation stone. And you see, during the Second World War, the Germans took over the island and occupied it. And it looked as if Hitler was going to rule the world. And all the British-born citizens that wanted to go were evacuated, and then anybody else who wanted to go, but there were many dead. Families were divided. The whole thing was a mess. And these Germans were walking up the main street, armies of them. Friend, there was no food. They billeted it with the people. They ended up throwing the people out of their own houses. People that used to have cars, there was no fuel. They're in bikes now, if they were fortunate. The butcher shop, even from the beginning, only opened two days a week, Friday and Saturday. Clothes were rationed. And this was only the beginning of the thing. And that stone lay there, ticking away. And if that stone could have spoken, it would have said, look, it's better to trust in the Lord. It doesn't matter if all the world comes against me. God's for me. He'll deliver me. And I'll tell you, the day come when Hitler put the gun in his mouth and blew the head off himself and the Germans had to go back where they belong. You see, we're talking about God. Who would have thought at that time? I wasn't compass mentis. I was only a baby at the time. But there are people here and they can remember it well. And let me tell you, there must have been days when they wondered what way this thing's going to swing. But hallelujah, God was for us. And if God be for us, who can be against us? Let's sing together in your red hymn book, please. 332, 332 please. My faith is found a resting place. Not in device nor creed, I trust the ever living one. His wounds for me shall bleed. Verse 2, 3 and 4 please of 332. Enough for me that Jesus saves, this is my fear and doubt. A sinful soul, I come to him, he'll never cast me out. I need no other argument, I need no
conversation He's a sick The last he came to see For me his precious blood he shed For me his life he gave I need no other argument I need no other plea It is enough that Jesus died 